Hello, and welcome, dear friends, in this 16th year of the Turner Winter Series. I'm Maureen Ravenio, proud and grateful to serve as Director for Religion at Chautauqua Institution, and grateful to have been associated with the Turner Winter Series these many years. We come to you for today's presentation, traditionally held at Chautauqua, with great appreciation to be here in the socially distancing capacity of the Kappa Theater in the Robert H. Jackson Center, this year virtually, in a format to which we have all become quite accustomed in this time of COVID. It is my great pleasure to begin today's conversation with a brief introduction of our guest, Michael Hill, after which I will turn the conversation over to our perennial host and the founder of this series, Jamestown's and the Jackson Center's own Greg Peterson. Today's conversation is a wonderful opportunity to catch up with President Hill in these most challenging and interesting times. Michael E. Hill is the 18th president of Chautauqua Institution, having taken office on January 1, 2017. During his tenure at Chautauqua, President Hill has accomplished much already. He has overseen the approval and implementation of a new strategic plan called 150 Forward. He has led the institution's response to the 2020-21 coronavirus pandemic and its associated challenges, including a significant investment in mission-driven online properties via the CHQ Assembly platform. He oversaw the successful completion of the $4.5 million Chautauqua Amphitheater project. He initiated the appointments of a new generation of institutional leaders in key strategic areas, and he created an expansion of the institution's engagement efforts within the Chautauqua community and with regional neighbors and partners, as well as with national partners. Prior to his appointment at Chautauqua, President Hill served as president and CEO at Youth for Understanding USA, and before then in executive leadership roles at United Cerebral Palsy, the Washington National Cathedral, and the Washington Ballet. He holds a BA in journalism from St. Bonaventure and an MA in arts and cultural management from St. Mary's University of Minnesota, and he is currently pursuing a doctorate in education in Vanderbilt's program in organizational leadership and learning. And with this inspiring introduction for our guest, who is also my dear president, it is now my pleasure to welcome in conversation Chautauqua's president, Michael E. Hill and Greg Peterson. Michael Hill, thank you so much. I am looking at a program. It says, Welcome Michael Hill, a reception welcoming Chautauqua Institution's new president, January 10th, 2017. I did an interview with you. It's on YouTube for those who are interested. And it was our first chance to meet. And um, since then, a lot has happened, uh, not the least of which you've added an additional dependent to your life. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it, it, it seems like in some ways just yesterday we were sitting here. Yep. I was a lot more nervous then. <laughs> uh, the faces were a lot more unfamiliar, uh, but it's good to be back at the Jackson Center. Well, thank you so much. And again, congratulations. Uh, uh, exciting things. Uh, here you are, the 18th president of Chautauqua Institution. Um, and you're cruising along and having a great deal of successes. And you will hear when you listen to the introduction of uh, your director of religion, Maureen Ravenio, all the great things you've done. Uh, but little did you probably realize that March 6th, 2020 would rock your world. Yeah. And how, just kind of curiosity, you, you wake up, you're probably on the treadmill and all of a sudden, what was the aha moment where you got some inkling that something was going to be askew? Well, so March, early March was interesting in my life and in Chautauqua's life. Um, we were planning for our wedding. Uh, my husband and I and our, our moms were up in Chautauqua for a tasting. Uh, I thought I was going to go back to Washington to do some work there. And I never left for nine months. 
Um, I literally never went back to our other home for nine months. Uh, wedding didn't happen, uh, <laughs> at least that way. Um, but in Chautauqua, we were gearing up for a season, I think, among our most exciting. It was on course to be our most attended season in the institution's entire history. Uh, sales were good, marketing was good, fundraising was good, and this story about this rare infection that had been going through Europe, which eventually makes its way into the United States. In March, we were all thinking, okay, if it shows up here, we've got March, April, May, June. We've got four months, this'll be over. As we crept more into March, it became clear it wasn't going to be over. Um, and just recently, I saw an image, our, our religion department uh, had offered in early March the beginnings of a weekly interfaith prayer for the pandemic, the first one authored by uh, Bishop Gene Robinson, our VP of religion, and it was timed to the cadence of how long it, should, it would take for you to wash your hands if you were following CDC guidelines. Mm. And I hung that prayer in my bathroom and thought for certain I would take it down before the start of the season and it's still hanging. So you get this inkling, you're watching the news and probably not sure it's going to really impact southwestern New York. you got to be kidding me. This is not New York City. This is southwestern New York. Uh, but as you're getting those inklings, who's, who, who did you make your first call to saying, <laughs> Oops, we got to think about this. Well, so one of the one of the really amazing blessings about Chautauqua is no one person or set of persons makes what happens there possible. The concentric circles of people that contribute to getting that incredible experiment and thought leadership and exploration up are many. Um, so you had our our own staff team, which at that point. The, the summer assembly season was more or less programmed. I mean, we always have those, those last moments, but I would say 80, 85% of our program was set. Um, so those folks were starting to ask questions about and hearing from the people they had booked, you know, were we still gonna be on? In early March, I, I really thought, gosh, I understand that this is gonna be a tightrope, but we'll make it, right? I just thought it would be over. Board members were calling, um, but in March we started to put together plans for what would it look like if we didn't convene in the same way we normally convened. Um, from my perspective and, and the leadership on the board and the staff, it was never an option that we wouldn't convene in some way. I mean, the history of the institution, nothing has knocked it down. The Spanish flu, the Great Depression, fires on the grounds, loss uh, by death of leadership it's always found a way to convene a conversation. So I knew that we would convene a conversation. I didn't think it would ultimately convene the way that it did convene, even in early March. But we started to put together plans of what would it look like if we couldn't bring people to the grounds. How did that formulate? There's no playbook for this. No. This is out of whole cloth. And, you know, did you kind of use a whiteboard and say, <laughs> gosh, Let's throw some stuff up and see how this might look. Well, so a couple things that were running in parallel at this time. Watching the staff team that puts together the program that ultimately becomes the, the in-person expression of, of the Chautauqua mission is, is just really humbling. These, these men and women work unbelievably hard uh, year-round to do this. And so just as you're starting to question whether that could happen, two things are going on on the staff team. There's grieving and mourning for this program that may not see the light of day. All at the same time, you're trying to figure out how to continue to have it go. Um, our strategic plan uh, ended up being unbelievably prescient and an incredible guide for us because that plan said, you know, we need to be thinking about ways that we can gather people in the country for conversation when they may not be able to come to our main campus in Western New York 
and they may not come in person. So the, the, the germ of an idea existed there. Mm -hmm. What ultimately became CHQ Assembly was at least a thought, <laughs> a glimmer in some folks' eyes, but it was intended to be beta tested for 18 months to two years. And uh, in March, when it became clear that the one pathway we might have that was somewhat bulletproof was a digital pathway, mm -hmm. uh, what we were faced with was beating up against um, a, a cultural piece that, and, and, and I say this with love and affection, Chautauqua is known for many things. Nimble is not top of the list. Our program folks are nimble when they have to pivot, but we have done we have done what we do very well for a very long time in a very similar way. And the notion of doing something radically different in a matter of days uh, was, was not really what I thought we would be doing in March. In fact, there are articles that I was reading that, that you have at this point no intentions not in March, not to have an in-person right. event. And as, the, and as things were progressing on your staff and your board, your chairman saying, Michael, c c could you possibly think the unthinkable? Hmm. Uh, did, was there a, such a moment where your board chair may have mentioned that, saying, I mean, I realize that's always a potential, yeah. but now it's front of conversation. Well, I have a, a relatively new board chair, uh, our first female board chair, about time, uh, an incredibly brilliant woman named Candy Maxwell. Um, and one of Candy's experiences background is that she thinks in terms of risk matrices. And so I had a board chair who was saying, we've got to play out the whole potential field here. Um, anyone that spent time with me will tell you that I'm probably the opposite. An eternal optimist, I truly believe we can move mountains. So you've got a board chair who's saying, let's plan for every possibility and a president who says, you know, anything is possible. Uh, and in my mind, in March, it was, there's no way we're not doing right. our season. Uh, and I think in her mind, there was at least a possibility, but at that point, to, to admit that and say that out loud had ripple effects that I don't know in early March we could have wrapped our headers around. So as this is progressing, you're looking at the CDC, you're looking for <laughs> guidance, Dr. Fauci and, and everything else that's going on and all of the ambient noise, uh, no problem, we'll be good by Easter, you know, listen to the, the presidential talk. You, you're doing a huge juggling act. I mean, every day you got to wake up with a migraine. Yeah, well, and, and the problem at that period of time, which we all lived through, was people were craving answers to questions that didn't have answers, right? right? Uh, so whether it was a Chautauquan that wanted to know whether they should come, whether it was a staff member wondering if they were going to have a job, uh, whether it was a board member wondering what it meant for the finances of the institution, um, None of those things had certainty. And as leaders, all we were trying to do was provide clarity, right? And, and there, was, there was just no playbook. And it was changing every day. I was saying to a board member the other day, I remember the week that New York State started to say you should not have people working in offices. Um, and initially it was you can have 75% capacity and you have to have a safety plan for those 75% of the people that would stay. And our team would create the safety plan, and by the time the safety plan was done, it was at 50%. And by the time that safety plan was done, it was at 25%. Mm -hmm. And within a matter of days, it was, unless it is essential that you are physically there and, and your operation will collapse, you may not be there. In days, I mean, so from, Everyone's gearing up. We're about ready to hire more than a thousand seasonal workers and do this season to you can't come into the office, go home. Days, right? I mean, unlike anything we'd ever experienced. So much of your work deal is interactive with your staff. Very much. I mean, that's your style and others. And when all of a sudden you have to work from home and you're this distance uh, created, and all of a sudden Zoom becomes a, a uh, a, a positive four-letter word, I guess. Uh, you know, what did that do internally? I mean, how, did, was that a, was there a helter-skelter aspect to it, or was there? A 
You know, I'm unbelievably proud of our, our team. Um, the strategic plan we just passed also said that we needed to modernize our technology, but we hadn't modernized it yet, still haven't completely gotten there. So the notion that we would send people home with computers and they would all hop on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, that was a cultural piece that was starting to show up in particular because we have a not insignificant number of staff in our DC location now. So some people had become really accustomed to interacting with their colleagues through these infam now infamous boxes that we find ourselves all in, but the majority of our staff didn't. And Chautauqua is predicated on interpersonal engagement, including at the staff level. So to send folks home, uh, not knowing when you would see them again, was completely countercultural to what the place stands mm -hmm. for. I mean, we most often say we are a convener, and that has always meant interpersonal interaction. And then you send people to the far reaches of their homes was a massive cultural adjustment. But what I would say about the staff team as well as that uh, the, the reason Chautauqua has always convened conversations no matter what was happening in the world is because the people that have put together that program just refused to quit and they didn't. They didn't and they adapted quickly um, and our staff is, is also intergenerational, right? So it's not as if we had a bunch of 20-somethings uh, who had always lived in a technology-infused world. We had folks up and down the gamut, some of mm -hmm. whom tolerated technology who all of a sudden now that was the only mode of communication. As you have various preachers, authors, big name acts, Friday night acts, agents, what's going on? All of a sudden there is a, I suspect, a drop dead date for the economics of it all where you have to can cancel yeah. uh, or call your friendly lawyers and, and find <laughs> out what you can and can't do. Um, was that a real reality? Oh, it was a, it was a significant reality. So to, to give a sense of, of time span, I and mean, we were talking about early March, the board of trustees of the institution voted in May that we couldn't convene an in-person program. So you figure March, April, May, um, trying to figure out how to pick up uh, hundreds of planned events and move them. Uh, contract law in the United States pre-COVID was very few if anyone would let you stream anything live because they were worried someone else would pick it up and then they wouldn't get hired anywhere else. Um, so we were moving things, and by the way, moving to a vehicle that didn't exist yet. Yeah. You know, I, I know many institutions went on Facebook or Zoom. That wasn't tenable for us because of the volume of program. Um, so what happens between March and May is the advent of something called CHQ Assembly, which is a multi-digital collective in which we're having conversation. I mean, and, and literally picked up the entire lecture series, the entire interfaith series, our chaplains and preachers of the week. All this stuff starts moving, including some of the arts activities, which hits a whole, not to get wonky, but hits a whole bunch of law where you've got artists saying, this is the only way I'm going to work, and you have contracts that say it's impossible to put them online. Right, and, and weeks, I mean, this is all happening over eight weeks. Partnerships ended up being critical for us. Um, we've developed and cultivated a really strong relationship with PBS. Uh, I called Paula Kirker, the president and CEO of PBS, and said, you all have an amazing digital presence. We're thinking of doing this, what does it look like? She gave us our, her VP of digital engagement as a, as a free consultant. So I mean, we convened people that are affiliated with Chautauqua, or at least knew about Chautauqua, a gentleman who had put the New York Times online, uh, one of the early founders, employees at Google. We were just pulling from every, everywhere. And, and again, the, 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 the irony of it for the folks that knew Chautauqua was we were saying, do you think we can get this up and running in a matter of weeks? Just don't move that fast. And again, that's not a critique. I think one of the things that makes Chautauqua special is its deliberateness, its, um, its thoughtful engagement, those things don't often go with, can we turn this on a dime? But that's, that's what, was, that was what was happening. So the Chautauqua Assembly, which is a, a unique, uh, may have been part of your uh, strategic plan, but certainly not as quickly, and as you said, beta tested for 18 months, and here was gonna be in play in two months. Yeah. Uh, 
what were the what were some of the real technological speed bumps you had to go through? <laughs> well, so you know our campus well. It is populated with grand, wonderful buildings that were designed to hold in-person conversations. Uh, we had to figure out uh, what spaces on the grounds were even, for lack of a better word, wired. You know, how do we get the content of what's happening still physically at Chautauqua into some sort of a, a web-based portal where we're going to charge people? Um, you know, we have an incredible team of people, none of whom had been hired to do what in essence was a television program or a film program. Uh, so part of what was happening was who on the staff had this extra skill set that we had never called on. So there was a gentleman who had worked in our opera company for years who ended up becoming a senior producer because he had a ton of digital experience. We had never called on that gift. I'm not even sure we knew that gift existed. We hired a couple of additional people, uh, the board as it was closing down our in-person season was it allowing us to invest up to seven or eight hundred thousand dollars to buy equipment that didn't exist um, so it's not as simple as you know point a camera and it'll go to the web because that's not what we were trying to do we right. were in essence setting up a digital studio that has five or six properties because like the regular chautauqua season there were things that were running concurrently so it wasn't uncommon to have our arts folks having a conversation while our religion folks were having a conversation and we more or less had two digital teams that converted the back of the amphitheater, the Hall of Christ, and Lene Hall into digital, uh, digital studios with equipment we had never used, that we had just purchased. Um, and when it broke down, you would see teams of people getting in golf carts, going to a different building to set up the program they thought they were gonna do in the Hall of Christ. My friend Maureen Rovegno knows and lived this well, and moving to Lene and shuffling things. And so the first two weeks of launch, I remember sitting in my office, or some instances, sitting in those interviews thinking, this is never going to work because things were crashing. And, and again, that's, it wasn't even, it, we weren't staffed to do this. That we didn't, you know, we were learning on the job. And then funny things would happen. I mean, Google had an East Coast outage one day in our first two weeks that took our entire program down. And yeah. people were saying, oh, Chautauqua can't get the program up. I'm like, it's not our fault. Google went down, right? Um, so that was what it was like. But by week three, what was incredible was to watch this group of people, most of whom had no digital background, become adept wizards at figuring out in real time how to mm -hmm. navigate conversations. And um, my board will tell you that for the months during the season and right after, I couldn't talk about this without crying uh, because the, the heroics of this group of people that understood that the one thing that was non-negotiable was convening a season. Mm -hmm. It just, everything else was, was up for grabs. That wasn't. And um, these folks just did not sleep. For weeks and they, they normally don't sleep but they know that normal not sleep this was a whole different wild west universe so what, now that you have survived <laughs> uh, the chautauqua assembly continues uh it has its portal and part of your strategic planning is a kind of a 12 <clears throat> months a year stuff mm -hmm. as opposed to nine weeks yeah uh and that's a sea change to get content and to keep uh, interest uh, off when people are not physically there or if they, at least if they were physically in their house, they knew that something was happening someplace right. on the ground. How has that been? How's that, that, that's, that really is a change. It's a huge change and it's one I'm extremely excited about. So the summer, going through the summer, a couple of things happened that I think allowed us to imagine continuing doing this work when the season was over. I mean, Chautauqua has flirted forever with what would it look like to extend the season. And our staff rightly, rightfully would say, look, it takes us nine months to put it up. It's nine weeks of running like crazy. And then there has to at least be a little breathing room to collapse. And what the advent of CHQ Assembly did for us internally on a cultural perspective is, 
you never get to collapse, mm -hmm. right? You never, there's not a natural break. Our core audience who had been with us uh, so deeply craved a Chautauqua experience that they took this journey with us on CHQ Assembly. And then I think realized, oh gosh, if they keep programming, I can have more of Chautauqua, even though I'm in whatever place I'm gonna be in, right? Because home community took on a whole different life during the pandemic. And I think for our teams, one of the things that became really intellectually wonderful was, it's not as if the world stops being dynamic when we're not in our summer assembly season. And the number of times we thought, gosh, you know, if we were up and running now, we'd have a conversation about X. Well, we were able to do that. So when Marcellus comes with Jazz at Lincoln Center in October, in October, right, to do 10 days on what art can teach us about democracy right before a pivotal election. Um, we, of the 10,000 subscribers that came to CHQ Assembly because we decided to make it a subscription base, half of them had no connection to Chautauqua before the launch of CHQ Assembly. Mm -hmm. So now you've got 5,000 people out there wondering what is this place, Chautauqua? What are they doing? Um, we did a partnership with the United States National Holocaust Memorial Museum. They, had, uh, they were releasing and celebrating a book called uh, The Tehran Children, which was also being featured in our literary arts program. They did a session for us. We had hundreds of people that had never been to Chautauqua and we were the sponsors that night. Uh, at, as the, the race, riots continued throughout the country, we started something called the Mirror Project where we were doing a monthly book club, sending books out to people, asking them to engage online with us year round. So the conversations kept going. And even as we think about this coming season, which, you know, in some ways deja vu, you know, we're in April now versus March, and I still can't tell you exactly what that will look like as we look at June. Um, we're starting to ask questions about and doing productions about, can people preview parts of the season? You know, can we be in dialogue and conversations with people to frame this, what we hope will be an in-person season? So it's opened up a world of possibilities for us. It's allowed us to not go dark, um, you know, with great respect for my staff colleagues who say, well, we never went dark because we're doing this work. For the, most of the public, right, one of the things that people mourn about Chautauqua is that it quote unquote ends. And now the, the endeavor is, well, no, it never ends, right? And so how do we operationalize that? How do we think about that? How do we use it to do good in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, becomes the, the, the beginning recipe, the beginning ingredients of Chautauqua's future. How has that affected the physical plant? I mean, you've got a facility which, you know, incredibly at the day one when the three taps of the gavel occurs, some other places, pristine. Mm -hmm. And it goes nine weeks, and then you shut her down, and maybe the hotel goes till November 1st, you know, things like that. But yeah. essentially, it's, it's dark. Yep. And yet, at the same time, you're having programming 24-7. Mm -hmm. Do you sense that there might be a, f a physical use 24-7? I, I very much do, yeah. uh, and have believed that um, since the day I showed up, that um, there is this incredible campus that I think it's irresponsible to not use for nine months out of the year. Um, COVID's been interesting for us because many, many people um, sought refuge on the grounds of the institution, mm -hmm. either in their own homes or borrowed homes, if you will, right? It's my grandparents' home and the kids came up. So all through the fall, I just remember looking outside the window of, of the president's house thinking, where are all these young people coming from, right? So. COVID demonstrated that it's actually pretty wonderful to live up here, so I think that's changing. Uh, we pushed the envelope and, and we just announced, for example, that Dance Theater of Harlem is coming for um, several weeks in April. We started to think about ways we could use our facilities uh, differently. As we look at the implementation of our strategic plan, one of the central questions is how do we add the right kinds of resources so that Chautauqua, at its grounds, actually has a life year-round. And, and that matters not only from a missional perspective, but I think about the potential impact for our community, uh, for our economy. Um, so it's very, very much a part of the planning and the thinking as we look at what will be Chautauqua's 150th birthday in 2024. Just out of curiosity, did you have any reason to look back in history of Chautauqua, of how Chautauqua's 
president dealt with the pandemic of 1918-1919? Was that part of your research to figure out how, how'd you do it? Well, so thank God for our archives and, and our uh, archivist John Schmitz is amazing. Uh, it, I'm always astounded when you ask John to give you a glimpse into things like that. Um, right outside the, the door that leads into the president's office is a portrait of every person that has ever been lucky enough to serve as president of that. And I found myself often during the pandemic staring at faces going, what did you do? How did you make it? Um, <laughs> And, you know, but the one, you take great heart in knowing that the place always has, right? So never did I hear anyone say, we might not come out the other side of this. And that's a tremendous blessing given how many not-for-profits didn't make it, mm -hmm. how many um, organizations had to furlough staff or completely eliminate positions. Uh, the legacy of the people that have loved Chautauqua was that we had the resources to get to the other side. Um, but there are many a day staring at portraits wondering what they were thinking during Spanish flu, Great Depression, all those types of things. Gene Robinson uh, wrote a piece that says, Chautauqua's DNA, or actually Mary Lee Talbot wrote this piece, Chautauqua's DNA is to pivot and not to go away when confronted with challenges, says Gene Robinson. Uh, what do you mean by that? That it's in Chautauqua's DNA to, well, look, I, I think Chautauqua at its best is a mirror to society. Um, it intends to illuminate the most pressing issues that human beings are facing and asks them to take the information, the inspiration that they get from Chautauqua and do something about it. In some ways, in the most simplistic way, the pandemic became that year's most pressing issue, right? So if you, if you think about what's baked into the place, which is to hold up a mirror to what's happening in society and to ask the questions about what we do about it, that just became our question for the year. It wasn't the question we thought we were gonna ask. Um, and it's, it's one of the things I love about the institution, it's, its design is not to solve hunger, it's not to uh, necessarily fix any specific issue. It's to help human beings understand what's happening in the world and to embolden them with inspiration to do something about it. And the pandemic certainly pushed us. Uh, our, in the preamble to our strategic plan, it talks about Chautauqua being a tapestry, and all of our pillars being the strands that form the tapestry. What I would say about the pandemic for Chautauqua is it kept stretching the tapestry, but the brilliant thing is it never broke. It just took a different form, uh, and it was a form we wouldn't have imagined, uh, but I think it's a form that's more beautiful than uh, we could have predicted. You concluded a strategic plan prior to all of this happening in March of 2020. <laughs> now that you're on the, hopefully on the, mostly on the other side of this, and it has stretched the words that appeared in that plan, are you gonna revisit it? You know, we have been. I mean, you've asset tested it. Yeah, so we, yeah. Uh, we will revisit it, but not to change it. Yeah. I think, Look, I think when humanity goes through something like a pandemic or a war, um, you look for lessons or you look for silver linings. I think human beings are wired to try to find goodness out of something like this. There's enough bad that we could find. The goodness for the institution was that it, it proved the premise of the strategic plan in ways we probably couldn't have uh, thought about. The premise of that plan said, what happens if there's a catastrophe one summer, what would we do? It happened, right? And for all the non-believers about why Chautauqua needed to push to do year-round programming or to stretch, um, one of the things I would most often hear is, yeah, it would be really bad if we lost a season, but we never have. And we didn't lose it intellectually. We didn't lose our missional focus, 
but we lost the revenue. And I think what that does is it gives us the fuel to really push even harder to reach the, the, what's outlined in that strategic plan. And for me, as, as someone who has the, the great um, luxury of being the spokesperson for this place and this mission, um, it really levels the naysayers, right? Uh, I think that plan is more important now, and I think we don't have to prove what it would look like if uh, the season was risked, because we just lived it. In your three taps of the gavel speech, you mentioned three items that are on top of your desk. <laughs> And one of them is a replica of a sign uh, that sat atop the resolute desk in President John F. Kennedy's White House. It reads, Oh God, thy sea is so great and my boat is so small. Hmm. What's that mean to you in this environment? Well, so it's, um, yeah, I look at that every day. By the way, I added one. Um, I was doing some reading, and uh, when Barack Obama became president, uh, one of his advisors, when he was talking about could we change health care in America, gave him a plaque that said, hard things are hard. So I, I bought that, so that's <laughs> next to it, is hard things are hard. Um, look, I baked into Chautauqua, baked into my own life is the belief that a higher power is, is steering more of this than, um, than we are. And the lived experience, I think, for all of us at the institution, I think for all of us in the world, was we did our best with the vehicles we had to, to navigate through the storm that we're still in. Um, never did the institution or I have the hubris to assume we were going to solve the pandemic. We're just a boat in it, right? And, and we had so much room to ferry so many things across to the other side. And for us, if you looked at it from internally to externally, we made a commitment to people. I was in, in, the, in a commitment the board shared. I was determined at all costs to get my staff to the other side without losing jobs. Um, God bless us so far, knock on wood, we've done that at, at great cost, at great cost. The institution uh, went through 85% of its cash reserves um, to keep people, but the people are what fuels that institution. Um, we knew we had a nation and a world that was confused and afraid and frustrated, we could provide content to provide context to these issues. That could fit in our boat. We could do that. Um, and the last ingredient we had to put in our boat was hope. And if we went dark, um, at least in our corner of the world, the corner of the world that we can influence, that may have been the worst thing to have lost. Um, so when, when I think about that, that saying and Lord knows Kennedy had far greater things to deal with than what comes on my desk. What that means for me is like, each of us has a vessel that we can use in our lifetime and it can only fit so much. And you, you decide what's most important. And for the institution, you know, it was people understanding and hope. And that's what we could get to the other side. That's what we're still trying to get to the other side. Do you wake up in the morning sometime and wonder whether uh, Chautauqua Institution, of which you're the president, is a, is a victim of COVID-19 experience or a beneficiary of the COVID-19 experience as it forced some real soul searching? Yeah, no, I think we're a beneficiary. I, uh, I think anyone that answers a question like that this way struggles to be honest about that because who wanted to have gone through a pandemic? Um, and we lost a lot. I mean, institutionally, we lost a lot. And the decisions we made had impacts on our home community in ways. I mean, we didn't hire a thousand, more than a thousand people. Uh, I know full well that many of those people supplement other jobs that they have. And so there, there was an impact to that. There was an impact mentally and emotionally to my staff, some of whom didn't get to go home. You know, one of the one of the biggest ethical dilemmas that I still wrestle with about the decisions we made at the institution uh, was what they call the essential workers. And for us, it was our buildings and grounds team who still had to come in and make sure that the campus and the grounds worked, who didn't get to go home to the safety of their home. So there was, there was a tremendous amount lost. There was also a lot gained. Um, I wonder if we would have ever gotten CHQ assembly off the ground. 
um, we w in a stable period of time, it would have made, meant the decision about diverting resources to do that. Um, this was the only way we could fulfill our, our season. So that was a blessing. I think our teams will never be the same. Uh, I think we proved that already extremely busy people actually could push harder. Um, I think each member of the staff that was up there discovered they had talents they would have never imagined lived inside of them. And there's something that um, cements a group of people that goes through something like that together. Um, I feel closer to my team uh, than I did pre-pandemic. Uh, and I think they believe and they should that there's not much that they can't accomplish. And for me, as we think about our sesquicentennial, that's thrilling. You have a group of people who have a lived experience that if they decide they want to do something, it will happen. So for all the folks that look at our plan and say it's too audacious, for me it's sit back and watch out. You, you knew you were coming down today. I and did. Uh, <laughs> uh, in anticipation of that, uh, were there questions that we haven't brought up today, Michael, that I should? <laughs> and, and bring up. You seldom have questions that you don't bring up. Uh, no, I, I think I, I was really, really nostalgic actually coming here today because as you started our talk together, uh, my first experience of this center was my first weeks of being president here. Um, and it's amazing now looking back how much I didn't know. Um, and the the, the, it's going to be my fifth season this year. Um, how much we've done, what we've seen, and now on the other side of the pandemic, my belief that it can be even greater uh, makes these are really these are really interesting bookends to my tenure so far, uh, from that first conversation to this one. Well, you're an incredible spokesperson. Uh, never, I'm sure, expecting you would be able to have to use that eloquence in a pandemic <laughs> aspect of it. Uh, and, and as you're looking towards 2021, and here we are, March 25th, um, if you had to crystal ball it, and I know that's difficult, you couldn't crystal ball it at, in March of 2020 <laughs> easily, but uh, what, what do you kind of anticipate? Well, there, there's a tremendous commitment to have an in-person season. I don't know that we yet know what that will look like, but I can be bold enough to say that we will gather people on the grounds this summer um, for the continuation. I think it's our 147th or 148th assembly um, to tackle the issues that the world has seen in the past year and to anticipate what the world might see in the coming years and simply thinking about the notion of delivering three taps of the gavel with anyone in the amphitheater uh, just gives me hope. Um, the last opening and closing three taps was delivered into a camera into 4,000 empty seats. Uh, it was perhaps the opening when I went out onto the stage of the amphitheater and saw it empty was maybe the first time I believed that COVID had arrived because in, in Chautauqua land to yeah. not have gathered people in that sacred gathering place was just unthinkable. Um, but then to close it and to imagine what it would look like even if those people were six feet apart in this coming summer was pretty thrilling. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I hope we are able to do as much as, as we've planned. Uh, the crystal ball really needs to come from uh, Albany uh, mm -hmm. because we're all beholden to the restrictions and, and the guidelines from the state. But what I do know is regardless of program, um, Chautauquans are coming home. And as long as that continues to happen, anything's possible. This is terrific. Thank you, Michael, for sharing, spending some time here in March. Looking forward to uh, our 2021 season. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Go Bonnies. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs>
You can have that. That's yours. Terps going cat. Sir. All right. Awesome. Now, here's what you need to do. I'm not. I'm not here to tell you what to do. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Here, here's 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 a thought. In in June, before the season starts, you're and the season has commenced in baseball. That you say, let's have a group night at the ballpark oh, there you for go. your employees. Ah. It's a it's a hot dog moment, and this could this could be really. Good. It could, and now I have a reminder. Yeah. I'm just, just saying, just saying. Pretty, <laughs> yes. Oh my God, that desk is getting a little full. <laughs> yeah. Thank but, you for yes. this. Kristen, I should have had you ask any questions. Anything? No, maybe? that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because you've always listened to <laughs> everything I say. <laughs> I know, it's true. It's true. All right, I need to rush back for an 11.30 Zoom. I'm so sick of Zoom. God, I'm so sick of Zoom. Right, I've got a noon, and I, yeah, I hate them. There is valuable archival preservation hmm. this year. Yeah. Really, really, really. Thank you for both of you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's wild. <laughs> it's there. It's preserved. Yeah. Well, not, yeah, it is. I mean, I, we talked about it in yeah. advance. Obviously, that's the goal is to kind of look back behind the curtain. Because as years progress, that will become vaguer. Yeah. Um, but it's such a critical part of, the, it will be a critical part of Chautauqua. Yeah. This is, yeah. That's unprecedented. John Schmidt, uh, early in the pandemic, wrote me and said, you know, can you pick representative emails and letters from this time and just send them to me? And as John would, he's like, send the good, the bad, and the ugly. So some of the things I sent were, you know, people saying, you guys are crazy. I can't believe you're doing this. Yeah. Others were, you know, really tearful. Um, I, I'm home alone. This is my lifeline. Please don't stop. Um, some of it was staff. Uh, again, good, bad, and ugly. I'm afraid to. I'm elated. I mean, it's so he's he's been really deliberately collecting these artifacts, Good for him. but this, this story of yeah, what was it like, what were you thinking, I, I've, I've just, I've never sat down to talk about it before, so thanks, it was, it was really healing.